Welcome to the Blending In Podcast, where I chat with innovative educators who are integrating edtech. I'm your host, Ashley Yazarlu, and I'm so glad you're listening in today. As teachers, we don't often get the chance to see into the classrooms of our colleagues, but by listening today, you'll get an auditory peek into the world of Steve Martinez, who works for Cami and with teachers from Turlock Unified and CSU Stanless. Steve has been an innovator in the Central Valley of California. He has won Emerging Teacher of the Year at Q. He is also a Microsoft Innovative Expert and Google Certified Educator. He focuses on flipped learning and project-based learning and design thinking. He's a speaker, a podcaster, and a professional development trainer for teachers all over the world. So I am so thrilled to welcome Steve to the show today. Just give us some insights on your expertise. Thank you so much for being here, Steve. Yeah, Ashley, it's so fun to be here with you. I know that we connected at Q uh, in person, so I love this show. I, I have caught a little bit of it, I've seen it online. So super excited to be here and be a part of the conversation. Yeah, thanks for listening to the show. Yeah, we connected at Q through Cami, actually. Like, I've done numerous Cami like PDs here for some of our teachers and, you know, helping come alongside them and integrating Cami into their classroom. So um, I came in touch with you and realized that you worked for Cami and you've been helping our district a little bit. So thank you so much for all you do um, and helping teachers with blended learning. Yeah, absolutely. So it's speaking of like blended learning. So I'm wondering, um, you, you kind of have a lot of different hats that you wear working for Cami and then working with the school district and at the university level. And I'm sure you've planned all kinds of blended learning activities with students and adults alike, um, with flipped learning, design thinking. So tell me more about like how you go into planning these types of activities for the people that you work with. Yeah. So I think the first part of that answer is the flipped learning component of what I do and and how I kind of integrate that into the classroom. I know that in the high school setting, when I was still teaching, really leaned into this idea of rethinking the classroom space, like that bell to bell, by having students learn the initial learning outside of the room via video content that I would create for them. So the planning of it was really how can we use software how can we check for understanding you using various different tech tools um, to learn what students know or perhaps what they're struggling with before they even enter the room? I think okay. anytime you're talking about video um, or the flip classroom model, like for me, I was like really early on as a history teacher, like you can talk a lot, but mm -hmm. I, I had this realization <laughs> of like, cool. So these videos have to be really concise. They have to be very short in nature, right? Like think about just the, how our learners are now. And that's no, no, I don't say that in a negative way, but like they're not going to be engaged for a 30 minute video. Right. Um, the attention span is so short nowadays. Yeah. Ex and that's not just kids. I think that's everyone. <laughs> it's, so, true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. So uh, it was really about like making them really concise, uh, being really purposeful with them. And for me, it was the data. Right. And so using uh, various tools that I won't mention openly, um, you know, working for Cami now, but like, so there are different tools that that were being used before I got to Cami to collect that data and to know what students are struggling with, what they know and letting the data guide the in-class instruction. Um, mm. And, and so from from there, I would really, you know, use that class time to right away as a bell ringer or a warm up. These these are the items that we're all struggling with. And I cater yeah. that period to period and sometimes grouping to grouping, depending on where everyone was at. And it opened new doors for customizing and personalizing instruction. Um, and, and and so for me, that the first part of that that answer is building content that you feel is engaging, that is intriguing, but also use the technology for good in the sense of learning more about your students it, yeah. in, in a way that I don't think is possible in the more traditional ways of teaching. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you were using like that formative assessment 
like mindset? Like, what can I learn about my students and where they're at in their learning um, based on what I'm seeing from the data that's being produced from these activities that I'm creating to get my kids engaged? And so how does that involve design thinking? Like, talk talk to our listeners like about more about what design thinking is and how um, you integrate that into what you do. Yeah, so really early on when I started flipping my classroom, it was a culture shock for me in the sense of it went from like, oh, I was talking, I was talking at kids for 50 minutes, but now I removed a lot of those elements outside of the classroom. So now like, well, what am I going to do for these yeah. 45 minutes now? Right. <laughs> um, and so I, I really leaned into project-based learning. It was something I read up on. Um, it was something that I worked on when I was in grad school. Um, but I did come across design thinking at a conference, um, way back when, and, you know, design thinking is, I, to me, it fits under the umbrella of PBL, uh, but more into okay. like the problem-based learning component of it, where students or anyone really can address a problem very purposefully by going through various phases and revisiting those phases. So, you know, the, this idea of taking a problem empathizing with that problem, idea, uh, redefining or defining that problem, working through the ideation, building a prototype, and then testing that prototype out into the community or some in your school or in your office, whatever the case is. Wow. And the first time I came across it, I was like, wait, I now have the class space to build something like this. Uh, because instead of talking at kids and giving a, a pop quiz or giving a quiz or giving a unit test. Like I got to the point where I wasn't even really administering tests at all. Like there was no standardized testing component in my class. Okay. And I got the admin support to to do that. Um, but it was more about creating these authentic learning experiences with design thinking and really leaning into the student's passion as to what exactly they want to solve. Yeah, I love that. And and so I'm curious about, um, I guess, like, are you presenting them all with the same uh, inquiry or problem or were they getting to choose which problem or what problem or inquiry they wanted to try to solve? And like with that, um, that element of how did you fit that in into like history? Like, how does that work with your content? I'm just curious about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so all fair questions. Um, yeah. I think, okay. So when I first started design thinking, I did do it to be fair in the context of senior level economics. So okay. the first time I did it, it wasn't in the history context, uh, though I was, I started to implement design thinking in world history as well. Um, and so with the, with the economics component of it, it was allowing students in groups to first identify what they're passionate about with respect to problems that they saw in their neighborhoods, in their school. Got it. Their okay. Yeah. And that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. And, and so uh, Genius Hour played a big role with that. Mm, um, okay. And so when I speak on design thinking, I do, I do the whole thing. Right. And, yeah. and so, um, and so if anyone ever catches my design thinking sessions, whether it's virtual or in person, um, I do walk them through the steps and what it's like to be in the student seat with all this. Mm. Um, and so like even getting teachers like, well, what do you all care about? What keeps you up at night? What bothers you? And these are the same kind of inquiry type of questions that I ask students. Yeah. And so they'll, they'll come up with some pretty serious like things that bother them. Right. Like, yeah. why is the Why is the school system this way? Um, why haven't we addressed this at maybe like the city council level? And so they they start to dive into it that way. And then that really gets the ball rolling with getting them to empathize by immersing themselves in the community with that problem, doing some yeah. action research, data collection getting a better, brighter story of why that problem is prevalent in their world. Yeah, I love that so much. Um, we actually in our district are, um, I don't know if you know, like state of California is 
implementing a graduation requirement for ethnic studies. And so I've been on a part of our district's um, ethnic studies scope and sequence team. So we're developing these courses, right, to pilot next year because eventually it's going to be this graduation requirement. And um, in one of the courses that I was working on, the, the very end of the year unit um, is a service action like learning project. And they have to identify uh, basically a problem in the community that was created or or um, caused by prejudice, stereotypes, racism, that sort of thing, and then figure out how they want to solve that problem. And so, um, you you know, as you were talking, I was just thinking about like tapping into to things and concerns and problems that students are passionate about is one way to get them really engaged. So those hesitant learners who might not be so willing to jump in and dive in when it's something that they care about and they're motivated by, then that's when we see them really start to blossom and come to life in the classroom. So that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and and I've been actually rebranding using different titles for this session that I've been doing for some time mm-hmm. with the passion-based learning component of it. Um, mm-hmm. Because the more yeah. that I use design thinking and the more that I taught design thinking, so not just students, but to teachers, the more I'm like, okay, the design thinking, that's the vehicle. Um, but yeah. what is the fuel? What's the fuel that we're putting in the car to get them there, right? And, and so for me, it was the passion. And I actually, I, I love your point, that connection between the passion and the engagement. Mm-hmm. Because so many times when I go in and I observe student teachers and even watching some cooperating teachers, no shade, but I, I see that we're confusing engagement with compliance. Yes. And yes. I, I, I just see that, oh, they're engaged because they're all quiet because they're all working on the same exact thing, fitting them in the exact same box mm-hmm. as if they were the exact same people. And yes. To me, design thinking opened up a new way of innovation to really have the content be as relevant as possible and to me, that's a shift for students. Like they would, uh-huh. it was, it was a culture shock for them. They're like, we had never been in a class like this. Like they would, they would tell me that because it's so yeah. different, um, yeah. but it's also so powerful and and the students see the power in it. Yeah. I mean, we've actually been working on sort of that mindset shift in the culture in our district too, with shifting from um, students will be able to do right. What that, that typical mm-hmm. objective language to I am learning, fill in the blank, right? I am learning about, I am learning to, I am learning how to, um, because students got into that compliance habit. Teachers did too. Like we're in this this system of compliance and we need to shift the focus to what is it that we're learning? That's what we're here for. So learn something new to produce like something cool, something innovative. And so how are we doing that? And and it, it, it does involve a big mindset shift. Um, so I'm just thinking about like just shifting that language, right? Just from going, students will be able to do whatever to I am learning has been a huge challenge. Um, so just thinking about implementing project-based learning or flipped learning or the concept of design thinking and this problem solving on this, on this bigger level to really engage students and drive their passions I know there's challenges that come with that. So can you talk about some of the challenges you've experienced it, you've experienced and, and what you did to kind of overcome some of those um, barriers that might've come up? Yeah. So I think the first thing is that it, it's just the culture shift. It's the students that you're, we were just talking about the compliance. Some students are so, you know, used to that kind of environment. Train. <laughs> Trained. Uh, yeah. and, and, and so um this there's some so there, there's there's a certain type of student that would really struggle uh with design thinking. Um and it's not it's not the student that struggles in school. It's the student that um they it's your AP student. It's your your A plus like you know like your role really follower. Good. The rule <laughs> follower. Yeah. They, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and so, um, I actually, I I've talked to my wife about this because she was in school. She was the gate student, right? She was AP yeah. really good at, you know, 
memorizing a bunch of information and then boom, like killing it on that test. Right. And she, she tells me, she's like, I would struggle in, in your class because it is not that. And so those students, they want to just be told, here's the study guide. Yeah. Go and learn this stuff. Yeah. But in my class, there was no study guide, right? There, there is, there was you, a problem, the content in your own inquiry, go try to change the world kind of mentality. <laughs> and uh, so that it's, it's, it's the shift of going from memorizing a bunch of stuff. Let me rephrase this. It was going from trying to memorize all this information to now you're the engineer of all this information. Oh, and, love that. And it's so, and so I was doing this way before AI was even a buzzword, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so I didn't really think too much on that then, but looking back now and seeing what's happening right now in education and just in the world, uh, I find it to be so true that who cares that we're asking our kids to memorize a bunch of stuff for such a small window of time. Exactly. What yeah. We really need them to do is they they'll go find the information, but what are you doing with that information to be a better citizen? What are you doing with that information to really address things that you care about? Because so many of my students would tell me like, Martinez, no one's no teachers ever asked me what I was passionate about. So I don't even know how to begin to answer that. Mm -hmm. And to me, that would break my heart. I'm like, wait, no one, no one asked you what you're passionate about. Like to me, this is like, this is, this should be the backbone of our education system of like, yeah. who are you as a person? Now let's go from there in terms of what we do in our classrooms. Uh, so I, 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 again, like just the shift, the shift of like moving them to really stu that student centered inquiry yeah. type of learning and away from a system that they've grown up with, right? It's all they've ever yeah. known. And to make matters worse, I would get them as seniors. So <laughs> they went through this whole time until the very end and they're like, oh, whoa, th there's like this new, <laughs> what, to, to them it's it was new, right? This thing that yeah. was like, oh, I, I, I didn't know that school could be this way. Yeah. Um, and I do have students now that they're adults and they tell me that like, um, it was one of their best experiences in school from an academic standpoint. Um, but they struggle going to college because when they go to yep. college, the environment then shifts back to that tradition for the most part. There's some colleges that are doing some amazing things. Uh, yeah. But for my students, the colleges that, that they've attended, um, it's a struggle. So it's a struggle to yeah. get there. And then it's also a struggle to return. I mean, I can relate to that because that's kind of how I was as a younger student. It's like, just tell me what questions I need to answer from the book on what page and what I need to study on the test. And I will be your, your straight A student that like does all the things. But I did find it challenging when, when I got certain teachers who challenged me to actually think deeper about um, important issues. And, and I, began to enjoy learning a lot more when I had teachers like that who pushed me to think deeper and not just do the rote um, schoolwork that we were used to doing traditionally. Um, and you mentioned AI, which is like, man, <laughs> the, the evolution the last two years alone in AI is just changing the learning landscape for us all. And um, every conference I go to there recently, there's been like session after session after session of people presenting on AI. I have been asked by my district to do a, a full day PD on AI in August when we come back for the next school year. And just thinking about this world of AI where we're starting to have, you know, more instant information. And we all thought like just Googling was instant information, right? But now it's like even more instant than that. How does that change or how do you anticipate this um, changing this the concept of design thinking or can it enhance um, activities that involve design thinking in the classroom? Yeah, I, I I think, you know, when I was, so I've been out of the classroom for about two years, like the high school classroom. Uh, so all, all this AI business has all been taking place since I've been gone. Uh, if I were to go back tomorrow, uh, I think 
I would really lean into what AI can do for the ideation component of all this. Uh, Very cool. That's where, that's where students struggle with. Like they, so <clears throat> what ends up happening is like once they have a problem, at least in my classroom, it was, you know, interviewing stakeholders that were knee deep in that problem, uh, polling, like collecting that data, that quantitative, qualitative research, right? And then yeah. taking that data, helping them make sense of that data to then how do we redefine what that problem is and then ideating towards a prototype. Um, I, I did not do that alone. Um, there was a level of mentors that I would bring in with technology. So yeah. those mentors were experts in particular fields, other educators like yourself, Ashley. Um, mm -hmm. Students were getting that feedback from mentors globally. I think with AI, what role could AI play with, oh, I don't have enough mentors to support all of my learners. AI could fill that gap. Now, will it be perfect? No, <laughs> but it yeah. certainly could fill in gaps and hopefully have students feel supported as they're trying to solve something that A, they really care about, um, but then B, that sometimes it does feel over overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I needed to support them on, you know, I would have students like, oh, I want to solve homelessness. I'm like, that's really big. How do we narrow that down? Um, yeah. So also having some level of AI support them in that area. Like, how do you make this obtainable in my area? Looking at data, like at the county level, um, you know, and, and getting, getting support that way. So I I think that's, to, to me, the design thinking enhances the AI of what could be done in the classroom. I think the AI can enhance the design thinking. I think it could yeah. be great very much like, you know, complement each other. Um, I think that, again, moving forward, broadly speaking, if we're becoming more and more uh, concerned with AI in our classrooms, I think the bigger question is, are, what questions are we asking our students and what tasks or skills are we building with our students? Yeah. Um, and, and so it can't be simply just answering the questions in the back of the textbook right yeah um and, and so that's my own two cents if you're listening don't agree with no, it that's cool I, but that's, that's no that's, that's kind of where I'm at yeah I totally agree with you like the ideation part of it I mean I'm already using AI to help me get ideas for moving problems that I'm dealing with in my day-to-day -day job moving it forward. So teaching students how to use that as a tool to advance where they're going with their inquiry, I think is a great idea, great recommendation for how to blend in AI um, into design thinking. So, so as we kind of wrap up our conversation today, um, what advice do you have for teachers who may want to give it a go with design thinking and kind of move away from more of the, the traditional, you know, teaching methods and into this design thinking mindset um, to help blend in some technology and maybe even AI into what they're doing? Like, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, so I think uh, there's, there's plenty, there's enough research and also uh, supports online around design thinking. So I think when you when you when you do look up design thinking, um, you know design thinking plus education, uh, and, and and you'll you'll get you'll hear from some amazing people that are doing some amazing work um, within design thinking. Admittedly, I don't know if we have enough professional development in this area. Um, I. I feel like, you know, there, there's, there's, there, there are people out there doing it and sh shameless plug, but like my, my company allows me to deliver PD for free um, yeah. and within, in any topic. Um, and, you know, so I'm, I'm sure you'll put, you'll have my info in, in the show notes. Oh, um, for sure. Absolutely. If anyone needs support um, I do, I do an hour long design thinking session. They get, 
they get all the resources that I've that I put together um and you know just spreading that word of what it is and what it does and for a while I was like should I still be talking about this I feel like no one's talking about this or no one cares <laughs> but every time every time I go to do it like I just see the light bulbs go off I see the big eyes yeah. I see like oh wow I didn't think about it in 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 this way um, yeah. and, and so wherever you search for design thinking, always try to look, are they providing me resources? Because that's the yeah. big thing that I try to provide. Here are the resources to implement right away if you if you choose. Well, I will definitely link your information in the show notes in case anybody wants to reach out to you to have some professional development on design thinking. I didn't know that you were able to do that um, in your role with Cami and the other um places that you work with your many hats that you wear, but that's really cool that you do that. Thank you for offering your services. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having well, thank, me. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciated our conversation and I'm so excited for people to get to hear what you had to say. Awesome. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to the Blending In podcast. I hope you gleaned some inspiration to blend in ed tech and some top-notch transformational techniques into your instruction. You can find show notes and resources from today's episode on our website, blendinginpodcast.com. If you loved what you heard today, leave a review and hit the subscribe button to get notified when new episodes are dropped. Also, follow us on social media and use hashtag blendinginpodcast to add to the conversation. Until next time, don't hesitate to innovate and integrate.